recording now. Right. Welcome. This is uh, the Mutual Aid Solidarity One. Um, I'll let you mute if you're in. Um, so the point of this is for humans united in mutual aid networks to come together and support each other to uh, adopt practices and really learn from each other um, in you know so we're not continually reinventing the wheel and so we can actually apply mutual aid to make our lives better since we obviously say that we believe it can happen so thank you for being here um, so uh, the point of solidarity or the structure of solidarity summits um, the aim, it was suggested by Kate McDonald. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to her today. Um, but the aim is to come together locally with whoever can, whoever has a need um, for mutual aid locally, and then for us to connect across our locations um, and support each other. Um, and then the idea is that we'll have a particular local need that we're aiming to fill. So there'll be a couple sort of beneficiaries of the wisdom of our guests each time. So the first ones um, are going to be us in Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, Dawn Morrison and the Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty in um, the Pacific Northwest. And I, she said she would be a little bit late, so I think she's not with us yet. Um, so uh, yes, we both have begun common funds recently, really on the fly. Um, and that's a form of savings pool um, where people um, in order to be able to give each other no interest loans and grants. Um, and we're joined by some people who have experience with that. Even though I mentioned that, uh, that Madison and um, the Working group, group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty are sort of specific requesters of wisdom today. Uh, of course, we expect and wish for everyone to benefit, um, and we all learn from each other. So, uh, it's a couple on the meeting have a lot more experience with savings pools and common funds and cooperative banking and money pooling than we do. So they're going to be our featured guests, and I'm going to turn the floor over to them very shortly. However, um, first we're going to go through and each introduce ourselves. And... Uh, yeah, just share briefly who you are, what brings you here today. I'll start with the people here in the room. Um, so starting with myself, talking, talking, apologies in advance. Um, I'm Stephanie Rierich, and I am um, founder of this form of mutual aid networks um, and the Humans United and Mutual Aid Networks and the Madison Mutual Aid Network. So I am here in Madison, um, because I really want to, I want us to redesign work. I want us to shape the economy in ways that make it fun for everybody. So that's why I'm here. Um, I am very happy to be joined with my old friends. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, I'm AJ White Wolf, uh, Minister for Social Justice Issues. I find that very important in this day and age that there is a uh, to me today, so that's why I'm here. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go in the order I see you on the screen. So, Angie. Angie, if you're able to mute and introduce yourself, that'd be good. And otherwise, we're going to move on to Tim and come back to you. Tim? To who? Uh, Tim, are you ready to speak? Are you able to message yourself? All right, then I see Terrell's iPhone. Yes. Uh, hello? Welcome. Hi. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, my name is Sean Bay Jones uh, with Cooperation Jackson, Outreach Organizer. Awesome. Thank you for being here. Great. No problem. Steven? Steven Hinton? Uh, 
and you're on mute too. If you're having a hard time seeing Hi, him. no, hi. Trying to yeah. unmute myself. Steve Hinton, British, living in Sweden with experience. I was on the board of the JAK Bank and um, one of the founders of um, uh, Transition Movement in Sweden and the originator of the um, Common Finance Canvas. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here and uh, especially Love so it. late at night. So uh, we really appreciate people being willing to deal with a lot of different time zones. Thanks. Yeah. On to Annalise, speaking of which. Welcome. And you're still on mute. Great. Yeah. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, I'm Annalise from New Zealand and um, I've been in a common fund for quite a while now, probably 10 years, and um, the, one of the first ones we started here to pilot it, and I see Phil is on here too, so Phil is the legend, so I'm just going to check out and be a, a listener more than a participant, I think. <coughs> Great, thanks for being with us. Don, hello. And you're still on mute. Hopefully you have a control to unmute yourself. Great. Hi. Welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself, Don? All right. Um, so while we wait for your... Is that you? So we can't hear you yet, um, and I'm not sure what it is because it doesn't look like you're muted, but um, we will love to hear from you when you're ready. And if your sound won't work, feel free to type in the chat. All right. So we just see your, uh, that you're having trouble with your computer audio. So um, as you work through that, if you want to type messages in the chat, we'll read them aloud and move on to Kurt, just to see if he's ready to introduce himself. Hi, Kurt. We don't hear you yet. So, Rachel, we'll go on to you. Hi, we hear you and see you. That's wonderful. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, I don't know what information you need for me. My name's Rachel, she, her. I live in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, any, yeah, like why you're here too. So having expressed interest in being part of the Common Fund or like why, anything you want to share about that? Um, no, I mean, I was just interested in the Common Fund. I didn't realize that I was going to be part of organizing it. <laughs> I'm here anyway. Thank you. Yes, the vagaries of cooperative structures that are new. But uh, yeah, that's our aim is to make it easy for people to plug in at whatever point of the process. But you just expressed interest early, so we try to drag you in. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so Courtney? Actually, it's Zev on Courtney Brooks' account. All right, nice to see you here. Go ahead and introduce yeah. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zev Friedman, and I'm uh, a founder and director of Cooperate WNC, which is a regional mutual aid network in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And um, among our other programs, we are working to develop a network of savings pools in Western North Carolina as a kind of economic heartbeat of a lot of the cooperative stuff that we're trying to do and um we've worked with phil who's on the call a little bit to learn about the new zealand savings pools model and have uh, several community groups who are starting them up including one that i am part of at my home at earth even eco village which is which is a um small business development savings pool specifically so i'm really excited to hear about the different experiences and um experiments that are going on with the people on the call thanks Is someone going next? 
Hey, Steph, I see I'm next in the list. Should I go ahead? Oh, sorry. I for, I didn't see that I was on mute. Yes, please. I was trying to call. <laughs> Morena Tato. Um, I'm Phil Stevens. I'm here in New Zealand. And I'm the, uh, the chair of the Living Economies Charitable Trust. And one of, our, one of the core pieces of our mission and our work is to promote savings pools and to help people set them up and operate them. And um, well, we actually, technically, we don't help them operate them. We provide uh, best practices, guidelines, info, and stuff like that. And I'm a member of two savings pools myself. They've been um, just extraordinary experiences. And uh, yeah, so I've, I've talked to a lot of you individually over the course of months and years, and good to see you again. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's see, Dawn or Kurt, if you're able to be heard. Oh, Dawn can't hear us. Uh, let's see, does, um, does anybody wanna type in the chat some ways to troubleshoot that? It might be that Dawn's computer is seeing her as being on the phone, but I can't really do it while I'm running this meeting. Could someone help her in the chat? Um, please. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Oh, great, great, great. Phil's gonna help. Thank you, Phil. Um, all right, that's mutual aid. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then actually, I just remembered that Angie also was having trouble um, with her uh, computer sound. So, uh, but Angie, I think, could hear me. So I don't know if anyone wants to assist her there too. Um, but Angie, meanwhile, if you can hear me, if you want to type your introduction into the chat now, that would be great. And I'll read it out loud. Um, and then, Tim, we haven't heard. Yeah. Great. Hi. Great. Um, so I'm also back to Madison, Wisconsin after a lengthy period away in Chicago. I'm an industrial engineer um, right now, very curious about everything that Stephanie and y'all are doing and just starting to get familiar. I've spent a little bit of time interacting um, on some of the local sessions. That's about it. All right, great, thank you very much. Now, has everyone said hello so far except Dawn? All right, um, yeah, so I am hoping we can get Dawn with us soon because we really very much uh, want to meet the needs that they have there in um, their new common fund. Um, so I think what I would what I would like to do first of all I want to be clear that I'm open to suggestion from people about um, how to structure our day. Second, we have just been joined by John Brown here um, in person, so I want to give John a chance to introduce himself too. Yeah, come around, John, because we want you to see all these awesome people on the screen. Um, so here's John. Brown, and can you just introduce yourself and say, like, what brings you here, what you're interested in with cooperative economy, just briefly. Uh, yes, my name is John Brown, and uh, I work with a service called Unified Madison that I'm boots on the ground. And what I what I what I like doing is, is the social social justice center. I like the network of services that I come to, and I found out that uh, that we can work with homeless. We can work with uh, institutionalized people, and it's, it's just a great opportunity to all of us get together and uh, solve a problem that can't nobody else solve. So I'm really happy about being a part of all of it. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. And um, we have very far-flung participants here. We have someone in Sweden who's worked on a large-scale uh, common bank, common, uh, yeah, and he'll say more about that. And we have people in New Zealand and in the Pacific Northwest with the Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty. Um, and also Angie Lally, who's here in Madison. And thanks, I'm glad that you can hear us. Um, and uh, maybe we can help you get your mic working too. And um, if you check on some of the notes on the chat. And then, um, 
Angie has been participating. Uh, so from Angie, I can hear everyone. I'm in Madison. I've been wanting a common fund here in Madison for a while. Wow. And uh, has Angie came to a bunch of meetings a while ago. We've just taken a, while, a long time to get started. Wow. But here. Um, here we are. And um, I have a couple of specific questions. And I want to see if Dawn has a couple of specific questions and also want to create a lot of opportunity um, for the discussion to flow where it wants to, because I think there's a ton of wisdom here and that can be built. Um, so uh, our, I think our overall questions, um, beginning questions are, what, what do beginners need? And I thought it would be good for each of us to explain our conditions that we're starting with. Um, and because I don't want to keep using, um, yeah, I'm going to just uh, refer to Dawn's group as WGIFS, which is Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty, so Dawn can call her region what she wants to. Um, and uh, each of us have different sort of models that we're working with. So um, when you're ready for it, I'll give the quick overview of sort of what we've established as some goals so far. Um, as near and long-term goals in Madison. Um, and the questions are, what do, what do we need as beginners to sort of help create, help plant the seed that actually will grow the plant we want to grow? So thinking of how um, a seed contains a tiny version of the plant as it will be. We wanna have a plant, we wanna have common funds that both express our values and our needs now but are poised to replicate and network in a way that can transform the global economy. All right, anyone wanna jump in now? Either someone who's able to, to speak out loud who wasn't before, such as Kurt or Dawn, or someone who has a thought they wanna share in the meantime. Kurt, you were here? And Dawn, can we hear you yet? And anyone know if Dawn can hear us yet? Okay, so hearing hearing none, unfortunately, on both those sides. Um, I'm gonna check with uh, Phil and Steven. I'd like you to uh, share uh, just briefly, it'd be really cool to just hear an overview of like a brief overview of your experience with this kind of model with related models um what it has done and what you think it could do so which of you would like to begin and assuming you don't mind being put on the spot hello hello Hey, yay, I, I made it. Fantastic. All right. So let's hear from you, Don, and um, go ahead and give your introduction of yourself, but go ahead and also give your introduction of your project and your common fund needs, since this is intended to be built around you and us. Okay, so um, I just want to check in, though I'm in a public place. I'm wondering about the background noise. Is it okay? Are you okay to hear me? It's okay. We hear the background noise, but the closer you lean to your mic, the better it'll be, and we can hear you. So if it gets overwhelming, we'll try to give you a signal. Okay. I do have some really cheap headphones here. It might help, but um, then I know that they don't work very well. They're not able to hear my voice as well. So yeah, do let me know. Okay. So you're, you're asking me to introduce myself and my work? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Don Morrison, and I am a member of the Shikwetmuk Nation in the Southern Interior Plateau of so-called British Columbia. And we are a sovereign indigenous nation. And I have been groomed by my people who have, who have worked to uphold a long legacy of political activism in in things like the Canadian, leading the Canadian Constitution Express, the Aboriginal Thailand rights, um, having that entrenched in the Canadian Constitution, um, among many other historical movements. Um, and so my work is inspired 
by my elders and my community in the, doing that work. And um, it's led me to the work that I do as the founder and the research curator of the Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty. And so I'm, we're doing, we've got uh, main, the main components of our work on Indigenous food sovereignty are to um, decolonize research and relationships in the food systems discourse. So really trying to dismantle some of the racist narratives on which the agriculture centric food system has been built upon here. And um, because nations in so-called BC, the province of BC are still um, unseated, meaning we um, haven't signed treaties with the Canadian government or surrendered our long-standing relationship to the land. Um, we're really trying to bring a more uh, culturally responsive narrative into food systems discourse. And so that involves research, it involves policy, it involves um, right now we're doing an emergency food security plan for one of the nations in the north, the Chilcotin National Government, who, who has um, recently won a significant court ruling within the Supreme Court of Canada, and now they're looking at wanting to assert their title and rights through uh, Indigenous food sovereignty then. And in the broader scope and scale of hunting and fishing and uh, gathering, and how that interfaces with a kind of a move the movement to a more sustainable regenerative farming narrative so that's the kind of work i do um we, we work with different food policy councils municipal food policy councils in various regions to look at um, policy and research and educational programs that can help to decolonize the food system and and we're getting an overwhelming response, which is great, um, but really needing to build the capacity and, and shift the narrative around the economics of it, um, because our, our economies, indigenous food economies, are subsistence economies, and, and they're cooperative, and they're, they're the most sustainable. They've been persisting into the 21st century, and some of our the ways that that economy is being expressed, um, but we're also having to live in this capitalist world that is causing so much destruction to our land and our food system um, in terms of resource extraction. And some of the things we're seeing with fossil fuels, these dirty pipeline projects that are trampling on the rights of our people and contaminating our water and our land. And, and a lot of that is feeding the, the global food system and the transportation and the, the fossil fuels that people are um, are are using to um, grow food in the industrial in an industrial sense. So the decolonizing piece is an important. We also lead two other projects: um, the Wild Salmon Caravan, which is a celebration of the spirit of wild salmon through the arts and and we organize parades and feasts and community forums and um, arts-based engagement events that uh, Indigenous communities host um, all along the Fraser Basin River, uh, which is the largest of five major river systems in, in so-called British Columbia. So it's, it, it spans across a, a quite pretty wide distance, the level of engagement we're doing and kind of trying to grow it Mardi Gras style and it's kind of turned into this big kind of movement now and we're just trying to figure out how to balance all that with, while at the same time being in a just transition to uh, uh, a more sustainable tribal economy that really reflects our values of giving, sharing, trading. Um, so we're really interested in learning about how the, the common fund and the solidarity sprint um, can help us to kind of cross fertilize um, what our subsistence economy looks like um, in, and how that interfaces with your work and the movement um, that you're building in, towards solidarity and, and in many forms. So. 
We also have one more project, the Indigenous Food and Freedom School, where we're developing educational materials and um, media and community planning tools, such as some of the tools available um, that you're offering and that I'm learning from, from you. And, um, and some policy primers. We're developing a toolkit, a written toolkit. So that's it. That's the long <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Um, so Phil uh, has a time constraint and I want to um, give him an opportunity to give a bit of an overview. And um, I also think though some of the specific questions we have will want to address toward him too. So I'm wondering, Dawn, in your setup of your Common Fund, if you have any particular questions that you want to ask that Phil could address as he sort of like shares some of his experience coming up, or if you want to just have him go with the, the bigger overview and then we drill down after. Yeah, well, I did, I did think of a couple questions um, and I, I know it's maybe longer conversations than what can, and likely is because I'm on a huge learning curve. Um, we went ahead and just started a solidarity fund because a member of our cohort needed money and like a few hundred dollars, like many of our people do who are, mm -hmm. the people that we're engaging are cases um, and doing really good work um, to be of service, but just need sometimes financial support. So we started a solidarity fund to, to shoot her some cash and um, and then we got called on by people in our network to organize a, a crew of people to go up to the Wet'suwet'en territory, who you've probably heard in the news, um, is holding it down to, to resist uh, a large uh, liquid natural gas um, project on their traditional territory. And so um, we raised some more money. We just did a call out and people gave money in solidarity. And so now we've got this money and I'm trying to figure out, uh, I don't want to be the one to govern it all. I don't want to be the one to administer it all. So I'm really interested in learning um, how we can, um, yeah, what kind of tools might be available to help us look at how we might, um, I guess, just think about how to, how other people are governing their common funds and, um, and of course we would you know we have our own kind of indigenous principles and protocols and practice around how to engage people in that conversation which um which is what i think our next step is um but then also the question around how do we do that and minimize the admin that's required because i'm realizing that one of the big sources of tension of interfacing with this capitalist kind of financial institution framework and accounting system is that it's it brings us down this road of being in this techno bureaucratic working in that way and that's actually what we want to get away from so as we get more money i'm realizing we get further entrenched into that and that's a real yeah if there's any tools available to make that easier to minimize our the amount of time we have to spend tricks or tips or ways that um, All right. So, how about if we let Phil take it away with that overall question, then we can keep, get, like get drilled down a little bit more specifically over time? Is that okay? Okay. And I just one more quick thing though, okay. because today I just um I just took a position with on the board of directors of CCEC Credit Union, a financial institution, and our board meeting. Our first board meeting is tonight. Oh. And so, uh, one of the questions I had there was. Could we create another form of currency? <laughs> I don't know if that's related to this conversation or not, but and if that's like, I don't know. There's, this is heard the right group to ask because all of our expertise, everybody has experience and understanding of a variety of currencies. So fantastic. That's a great, great lead in. Anything else before we let Phil? Share? No, that's it. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Exciting. All right, Phil, it's the floor is yours. Oh, cool. Um, actually, the the questions from Dawn are are perfect, and they, they kind of align with a lot of the thinking and, and some of the stuff that's, 
I think slowly being put into place here in New Zealand with some different ideas we've got going. Um, I, I guess there's, there's kind of a lot to unpick in, in, in the question of technology and decision making and governance and all that, because one thing I've noted over the years um, in my personal experience with savings pools and talking to other people who are in pools is that there's a lot of overhead. There's a lot of mind work involved in being in a pool and, and not just mind work, there's heart work. So if you've got a group of people who get together to support one another and do this sort of stuff, you go through an initial period of learning everybody's situation, kind of learning the ropes on how to, um, you know, how to give and receive, structuring your agreements, developing your protocols within your pool, figuring out what works for you. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the, the New Zealand pools model, we use, uh, most of us use a, a consensus-based decision-making um, protocol. A lot of us use Lumio as an online tool to help us do things that don't require face-to-face -face meeting or as an adjunct to face-to-face -face meeting and also as a way of keeping records. So that way you, you can record uh, people's agreements. We can record the discussion. People may ask questions about a certain thing. People may have ideas. Um, just a quick aside, in, in my pool recently, we've been having quite a drought. Um, about three quarters of New Zealand has been just hot and dry. We're not on fire like Australia was, but um, it's, been, it's been really pretty tough. And a lot of towns are actually running out of water and farmers are having to sell stock early. It, it's a bit of a, you know, not a full on emergency, but it's, um, it's a pinch for a lot of people. So a lot, of, um, a lot of questions in my pool lately have been about putting water tanks on our houses to capture more of the rainfall so that we can keep watering our gardens when it's really dry and the, some of the towns put on hose restrictions. And so the questions started coming up in meetings and we realized that between us, we had a lot of resources that people didn't necessarily have to go out and buy a whole lot of stuff. So like I said, oh, I've got, you know, I've got a couple coils of tubing. I'm happy to just, you know, chop off a piece if somebody needs it. Somebody else had a, a spare tank that was sitting around that, that wasn't hooked up to anything and they weren't planning to hook it up. And so these, these conversations start when somebody's looking at borrowing money from the pool to do a project and they realize that some of the things they thought they needed to buy, other people in the pool actually have. So those are some of the things that come up and they develop along the way. And it's just this mutual support that takes you outside the, the money economy. But something that I think is really, um, is really paramount to remember with a pool is that it, it, it is an investment of, of time and, you, you know, your, your engagement with the pool. And that can actually be a, a a burden for some people or it can be difficult for everybody to manage all the time and as a pool grows you usually will, will reach a point with most pools where it's kind of like you don't want to get any bigger like with the the pool i'm in that's a face-to-face -face meeting pool we pretty much capped it when we realized we can't fit in so-and-so's house if we get any bigger so when we get together for our shared meal we rotate and meet at a different person's place each time. And we realized that, oh, if we get any bigger, we can't all cram into so-and-so's house. So we probably ought to cap it here. And this is kind of a nice, comfortable number for us. With the online pool that I'm a member of, we decided quite some time ago that we could get as big as, as you know, the platform would handle. And we'd know when we were reaching some sort of limit. And that hasn't happened yet. But what I do notice is that as you get more and more people into a pool and you're still trying to make consensus decisions, if somebody comes with a request and it's kind of urgent, like maybe they need, they need to go and see the dentist because there's something, they need a root canal and it's kind of a big deal and they need to do it soon. They need the money soon. 
sometimes if you need a certain percentage of people to say yes before the proposal passes and people are slow in checking their email or logging into the Lumio site or things like that, it can take a while. And that leads to a bit of a breakdown in process and it's maybe it's not quite fair for the person who's asking for the money because they've provided all the information and the people that have been timely about making their decision, but the group requires more people to get involved to make the decision. So groups come up with ways to get around that. They, they will put a time, li time limit on a proposal and they will say, if you haven't responded to the proposal within the time frame, that's counted as a non-blocking um, abstention. So it just means that you're not actively supporting the agreement, but you're not preventing it from going ahead. Some pools actually say that non-participation counts as agreement. Other pools say that if, uh, if you don't have a, a full um, uh, quorum or number of members agreeing, but everybody that does weigh in says yes, that you can go ahead and pass it. And the other people then have a right to come in later and say, well, I don't want, I want to ring fence my funds out of this. And they get to put forward the reasons for doing that anyway. It gets complicated. The more, the more people are involved and the more things you want to put into your processes to get around that. So I'm really intrigued by the whole notion of the common fund because this to me sets up a sort of a new level of participation. So the cool thing about the common fund is now you've got, you sort of got two levels of money or funds in the pool. You've got the, the funds that people put in that are their savings that they are sort of like they're, um, I guess you could say they're invested in, in, in terms of a decision-making capacity. And then you have this other fund, this magic fund that people are doing when they round up or when they just, chuck a fiver in the, the tip jar or same things like that. And to me, that is a, a nice case for saying, okay, maybe we can have a different level of decision making. Maybe, maybe we can have different protocols and different governance over part of the, the fund where we say the savings pool component, we still manage by some sort of consensus platform. But this other part, this investment fund, the social enterprise fund, this, you know, this um, giving fund or whatever you want to call it, that sort of goes into a separate bucket. And we say, let's entrust a group, a small subset of our group to decide who gets that and un under what terms. And that can even be something like a, uh, a rotating assignment. So let's say you had 500 people in your common fund and maybe it was spread out amongst 50 savings pools or well, not, that's not even a good example. Maybe it's 25 savings pools of 20 people each. And you said your savings pools still operate like savings pools do, but your common fund would take um, a representative, one or two representatives from each pool. And it could be on a rotating basis who agree to take the applications and help make decisions on behalf of everybody where this money goes, because it's, it's sort of like a different level of, of risk. And you, you're basically saying this money has gone into something that's more in a gift setting than a savings setting. So people, you know, people aren't relying on it being there at some point in the future. So I'm really intrigued by the way that could work and we've started sort of sketching up a model of how this would all come together and, and developing a, um, a plan for, you know, from everything from software to a website to a blockchain ledger, all kinds of things to do this. But then what really sort of um, struck a spark for me was when I saw this idea of having a card and the idea that you could go to participating merchants and swipe your card to pay for things and say, oh, put another $5 or round this up. And then that just sort of made it click to me. And I said, aha, 
here's how you grow that that gift pool you know so that to me the common fund has that magical piece that the savings pool the pure savings pool model was missing and that has always been well savings pools are great for what they do but they're limited in that you don't have a sort of a discretionary component that lets you do things like investment or um, grants and things like that. Whereas this common fund model sort of throws the door wide open and brings all these things into bear. So um, I'm just really excited by the prospect of that. And what I'd like to do is just hear other people's ideas on how they would, how they would set up that governance. Now that, now that you've heard mine, um, there's, I'm sure there's some other models out there that are also equally reasonable and, and could work even better. But so I guess, you know, to not go on for too long, that's kind of one of the main things I'm interested in. I'm also interested in hearing about, um, and it doesn't have to be in the context of this particular gathering, but at some point I'd like to talk to one or more of the techie people that are in the, the loop with the card and the, and the electronic transactions part of it. Um, Cause I just want to get my head around how some of that could work especially without becoming a financial institution, which is really kind of a don't go there thing these days. Uh, if it's all so right. yeah, that's, um, that's what I've got in that realm and I'm happy to take other specific questions if, if they apply to sort of the New Zealand model. Great. If it's all right, I'll jump in here to um, to share a couple reflections on what you said and clarify a couple of things. And then I definitely want to give the floor to Stephen soon and others who want it. Um, so if you want to say something and uh, maybe just uh, type in the chat. Um, yes. And for now, so uh, yeah, for now, I'll just like share a little bit. Um, about the common good card. So, or well, I'll, I'll backtrack a couple steps. So Phil's been referring to how uh, when people participate in a savings pool, they often through the conversation find that they don't need as much money as they thought because the people in the pool have other resources or sorry for lack of a, have other offerings to bear on the situation. And um, as I think most of us know, or many of us know, that's what mutual aid networks are designed to sort of like formalize, structuralize. So that's why, and to build in the governance and sort of connect it all together. So the point of a mutual aid network is now we're a co-op, we become a co-op of people who are in a co-op together just to support each other. And we're gonna use time banking and we're gonna pool money and we're gonna use, we're gonna build all the shared resources or all the shared sorry all the shared things that we can in order to reduce our need for money and give us a good quality of life um and so one of the things like for our governance um vision it's it's there's a lot of similarities to what you described phil and i was really happy that you just put it in a nutshell like we can have separate governance for a giving fund that can operate on a more emergency basis than the savings um, or different tools that could overlap. And that was really helpful because that's one of the questions because we want to do different things with the fund. And then um, Phil mentioned the common good card. So not everyone's familiar with this. And um, we actually specifically decided not to invite them as a particular participant in this conversation just because it gets so complicated quickly just to um because a lot of people are learning about the straight up common fund for the first time um so the common fund is like your savings and loan if you're comparing it to a real you know to like a real life example the common fund is like a, a savings and loan and then we want to hybridize it to be also doing to also be doing giving and have it be like a community chest as well um the common good card connects local currency sorts of ideas. It connects actually like time banking kind of ideas and mutual credit kind of ideas in that we can exchange with each other at local businesses um, 
we can sort of exchange credits. We So a, a common good card is actually a debit card that you put actual cash onto. So I would like, I have paid a hundred dollars into it. I So it's sitting in an account in Massachusetts. So it's kind of like a savings account? Yeah, it is a savings savings account. It's sitting in an account in Massachusetts and Phil, the, the, the key here is the mass the organizations come the organization common good in Massachusetts has registered as a financial institution so we're all cool so we can just participate with them so I have the hundred bucks on my card it's in an account there and they're administering it and while that's sitting in the accounts while we're trading against it sort of we can choose to loan out part of it we can collectively manage it and do exactly what banks do, frankly, because when you put a deposit in the bank, then that counts toward what they're allowed to loan out. Um, but we would be doing it with a very specific set of principles and ethics, and it would be loaned at no interest to people in our own community. Um, and then, and then um, what Phil was referring to is all these mechanisms the Common Good card has to like, build your community chest they make it very very easy to round up on your purchases and they like really encourage people to to donate so it's like built to create that and there's governance in it um if you want to look at more of the specific tools you can look at commongood.earth and we will host we will host a, a solidarity summit that's focused more on common good and it's it's a priority for us to do here as well we just like we're worried it would get too confusing to talk about both of them in one session. So apologies if we're missing a, a chunk that you would like. Should we hear from Steven or did, Phil, do you have any quick response to that? No, no, that actually answered my question um, in the first instance. And Annalise has um, suggested I get in touch with, with William Spademan directly, so I'm going to probably do that as well. So, yeah, great. And any way that we can do stuff, you know, join forces to do stuff that we can like all benefit from each other's learning life. Yeah, please. Um, I'd be really happy to learn uh, as you learn or after you learn if you can document it some way. Thank yep. you. Um, sure. Speaking of ways in which New Zealand folks are helping us learn. If you can see my screen right now, I've shared this in the chat and this link is available to anyone or you should be able to look at this, anyone with the link. This is our savings pool workspace. Um, we should probably change it to common fund workspace, but this is where we're sharing a lot of stuff that we've gotten from New Zealand, but also from other places and also our work as we go. Um, but like the Time Bank in LA has a revolving loan fund and um, so here you can see other examples and um, there's a game here that you can play that really helped me see how really simple it can be. So um, everyone's welcome to use these things and I want to thank our New Zealand partners very much for supporting us for so long. So um, and then that said, I'll thank our Sweden partner and Stephen, do you want to share some of your work and some of your current perspectives? Yeah. Um... This is quite interesting. Um, un unfortunately, I don't really have a lot. Um, I don't think I have a lot of experience to give uh, practically, although we've done a lot of the theory. Um, as I said, I was on the board of the JAK Bank. And, um, Can you describe what that is? Not everyone's familiar with it yet. Okay. Well, JAK Bank is a community bank. Um, it's, it's a bank that's owned... Um, as a cooperative and um, they don't want to um, do what banks do, which is create money. So um, the way that, that the JK bank works is that you put money into your own account and um, while the money is there, it, it earns uh, what they call points. And then when you want to, uh, borrow money then um, there's no interest on it but there are points so that's to say if you if you want to borrow say um, thousand dollars then you have to have for a year then you have to have saved a thousand dollars for a year um, that's that's the way it works and um, uh, 
uh, uh, people I think came into this from an ideological perspective more than a, um, Hey, I'm desperate. I need some money <laughs> sort of perspective. Um, and, um, a lot of people who uh, use the bank are actually Muslim because you're not allowed uh, it, or it's not, it's not, um, uh, interest is not um, seen to be um, uh, congruent with the Islamic um, uh, religion. Um, the other stuff I, I've worked on is because I was in a, a, an echo village, I, I actually uh, did the um, I did the business plan for the echo village, and also the um, uh, the financial plan for it. So um, I've got a bit of practical experience there from that i created the, the canvas the canvas is the community finance canvas and the canvas is designed to help people think through um what assets they need uh, what pools they need to create those assets and what financial flows they want to or, or they will have um uh, with a lot of tips and tricks about how to um, how to think about um, the difference. Um, uh, maybe I'm speaking here to our um, uh, indigenous friends here. You know, like capitalism is actually a very simple thing. It's capitalism is where you have an organisation that's owned by a, a particular set of people and they employ another set of people and um these the other set of people um called workers then create products which are sold to consumers now um from a community point of view you have another idea because um you don't have owners and you don't have um workers and you don't have consumers because you're all the same thing. You you all you all own the assets. You um, you uh, use their fruits, but you're also involved in creating them, and that's really the essence of of, of common thinking. And I think it works more with local communities to to help people see that they are all of these roles. And it's really the um, it, this trick is to get people to um, jump out of, uh, if you like, capitalism thinking and to jump into common thinking. And then um, I, what I would say, what I've learned, because I've been doing this quite a long time, talking about it at least, is that um, there's one thing that we all really um, locally that, that we... Um, uh, that we own or should own, and that is the market. I think the marketplace should be owned by local people. And what we're seeing here in Sweden is awful. You know, it's like the market is actually owned by private forces, which means that small businesses are shut out of that market. Even small towns have like huge, um, what do you call it, local shopping centers which you have to pay a lot of money if you want to set up stall in. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if this is helping, but this is the way it's going here. I mean, we really, in Sweden, we don't have really local economies, unfortunately. And we don't know how to get them back. This is one of the biggest problems of the um, transition movement, which has also spawned an arm of the transition movement called the Reconomy economy um groups in around the, uh, the world I'll, I'll stop there but um i might have a lot of theoretical answers but um i don't have a lot of practical experience uh, what i try and do um here locally uh, the first thing i do is um to say hello to people Whoever I meet, I say hello. The second thing I do is try and invite people to food and um, get to know them a little bit. And then the third thing I do is try and be kind and lend them stuff, things like that. <laughs> That's the kind of level I'm at. <laughs>
No, that's that's fantastic. I mean, so again, the point of well, I mean, the point of these things is to support everyone with what they need to meet their own needs to have their best life. And uh, if there's some way we can support you to um, help create the local situation through like smaller scale kind of common funds. Yeah. Um, you know, it has really helped us to be doing time bank stuff and, and you know, all our various cooperative economy stuff, I think really has helped um, knit things together differently here over the years. Um, so Tim has a question for you. I'm not sure if you see it, but in the JAK Bank's point policy, is it also the case that if, if I save uh, 2000 for one month, or wait, if I save 2000 for one month, then I could borrow? I don't know, Tim, can you want to just ask your question? Sorry. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's well, hang on. One second. Sorry. If, if I if I want to borrow if I want to borrow a thousand for a year, is it possible for me to have just saved twelve thousand for one month? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Very useful. Yeah. Um. So does anyone? Should, well, first of all, should we stop and explain that? Like, is it better to get in the week that way, or like go more toward? You, governance. I, it's important to know how it works, but that might be there might be easier ways to do that. But. Yeah, let, let me talk about that. Um, uh, let's just say this whole thing about the point system. Uh, it's it's unique in the world, I think, and um, uh, it it can only work because uh, JK Bank has forty thousand members. And um, the 40,000 members pay, I think it's uh, $30 a year. And that really pays for the, um, uh, the IT system. And the way they're doing it now is, is that they're renting the IT system. It, it's a banking system that happens to have point systems built into it. And this is new because up until about two or three years ago, um, JK Bank had to have its own programmers and a computer department because there was no point system in, in financial systems. The other thing about it is it's extremely difficult um, to follow the Basel Bank uh, regulations and um, we, they have one person full time who just deals with financial reporting and financial risk handling. So, I mean, I don't think small communities really should go there yet. The only way that that, that could be done is, is if you've got a lot of small communities who get together and, and, and pull their needs. Yeah, Zev, who's with us, is looking to start a bona fide credit union institutional forum. And, and I would like to give the floor to Zev in a moment. Um, mm. Just after saying that um, that we and the other partners that I know of currently working in the human are looking to make like a grassroots version of the JAK Bank, um, a la the savings pools of New Zealand. So. Um, I think that story, you can stop me if I'm misrepresenting it, that Brian went from New Zealand to visit the bank in Sweden and came back with an idea of how you could apply this at a neighborly school where you're just managing an account in a credit union or a bank that you share instead of making your own financial institution. That's correct, right? Okay, well here, okay, yeah, so jump in if not. Um, and Zev, did you want to share a little bit about what your dream is with the credit union? Um, sure. Yeah. So, wow. Um, I've been learning so much and we've barely even begun, but just from the process of approaching these different things, it's really been um, shining a laser pointer on the distinctions between the different ways that we use money or want to use money in our communities. Um, and just yesterday I was having a all day retreat with Carmen Lesher who spoke with Phil and got a lot of advice from Phil on saving school establishment here. Um, and we were kind of going back over our big vision of our savings development approach here in these 22 counties of Western North Carolina. And we had had this dream of 
of an, a savings pool association, which was something that had come from hearing about an attempt to do that in New Zealand, where a bunch of savings pools could kind of link up and loan money to each other or pool money together in a larger, a larger pool that would allow uh, larger scale projects to be financed. But then how that once you start doing that and, um, and uh, any single person's money is not in their direct control, that starts to trigger securities and loans regulations in both New Zealand and the US. And um, that's a huge complex thing as, as uh, someone mentioned. And uh, so, you know, but, but all that came from originally, I was reading about the history of credit unions and mutual aid societies and cooperatives in the US and how um, the regulatory hurdles used to be a lot lower to establishing credit unions here. Uh, there were like 50 black owned credit unions started in Eastern North Carolina in the space of six years back in the 1930s um, because there were, there were the regulatory hurdles were a lot lower um and now we're, we're looking into it and it's like takes something like 30 million dollars of deposits and um and uh three or four hundred thousand dollars a year in operating costs minimum to um start and operate a credit union um in the u.s uh but just yesterday carmen and i were coming back around to maybe it is a it, it is the best long game thing for um, setting ourselves up for large loans for like building uh, major community buildings or buying large tracts of land uh, for community land trusts to manage as farmland um, or starting a healthcare cooperative, which is one of the things that we're trying to do here. Things that take many hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, a credit union could be the, the best strategy for doing that. But then there are these other types of of use of 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 money that maybe use different mechanisms and it's it's kind of a, a both and or all and thing rather than one or the other and and so like for savings pools to me what that was coming into focus is they're so relational um i i, I hadn't heard phil speak about the um the online ones but the but like the in-person one that that we're beginning and working with a few groups to begin is it, it the whole thing is it seems to me like it's all about trust and it's all about a group of people who already know each other and have a pretty high level of trust and kind of uh, frequent interconnection in their lives and want to spend more time together and have dinner and have a meeting once a month and um and so and it's and it's not going to get you know to the millions of dollars usually in terms of uh lending power um, but it's it's something that can help people start small businesses or pay off a mortgage on a, 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 a down payment on a house or pay off a credit card debt, things like that. So that's like one function that is that we can start acting on right away. And that's what we're doing is is working to get savings pools going from the kind of asset based community development perspective, which is with with each community um, figuring out who is their trusted network, who are the trusted 15 or 20 or 25 people who already uh, know each other and trust each other enough that they would want to go deeper like this. And then looking at what are the biggest needs of that community and what are the biggest assets of that community and how could a savings pool come in and um, essentially uh, unleash those assets to serve the needs. So like in one, in one community we're working with, it's another intentional community in Western North Carolina, um, they discovered that the biggest unmet need of the young people in the community was affordable housing. Um, and, but at the same time, there were several builders in the group who didn't have enough work. And so they started to start, decided to start a savings pool that's focusing on creating uh, small affordable houses for people by hiring these carpenters in the group who are starting a builder's co-op, a cooperative worker-owned uh, builder's co-op now. Um, and that savings pool is kind of focusing on that. So like savings pools, that's how we're seeing them is kind of driven by specific community needs on a small scale. Another thing that I think needs to happen is wealth redistribution. And that's not what savings pools are doing. And so we're looking at, and this kind of intersects with some of what I'm hearing in the common fund idea and in Phil's reflections on, on that, um, uh, or what some people call a giving circle where essentially people who and uh, organizations who have money put it into a fund 
which is not about getting investment returns and not even about getting that money back, but rather about putting it in the hands of other communities who don't have resources for them to meet their own needs with. And so we're looking at that, how can we create essentially like a, um, a racial equity um, giving circle or wealth redistribution fund as part of our mutual aid network that would be separate than savings pools. And that's about really investing in communities that don't have much financial wealth yet. Um, and then the, then the last thing would be the large scale thing is how do we, whether it's through the common fund, through a credit union or some other mechanism that uh, we haven't discovered yet, how do we get a large enough money, uh, pool of money together that we can start to make major transformative investments in land, buildings, infrastructure, major organizations that can kind of transform the content of our, of our community. Um, and that's probably the most challenging one, but also really necessary. And we see that as maybe after we get 50 savings pools going on, then we could have the capacity to look at starting a credit union. I'll stop there. Great. Um, so I have a couple ideas about how to move forward. Again, I'm going to invite you to jump in if anyone has a better idea. Um, so, uh, and I seriously do welcome that. Um, so Zev, you, you uh, scoped big to little. I want to refer to this big thing for a moment um, because I've been uh, setting up for the next Solidarity Summit. Is it the next one? Yeah, for April 20th to be um, tentatively, uh, that we have uh, good committed participation to be about um, cooperative, about mutual aid for affordable housing and large scale projects. And actually Kevin Jones from your area has agreed to be part of the conversation. So I shared the link um, in our notes, but you can see right here, he has assisted to set up and finance um, essentially a common fund that's helping Somali immigrants to buy homes because they won't participate right. in the banking system because of interest. If, if we could have the people that you're referring to and Kevin, um, and I would encourage you to get people together locally if you want to and you think it could be fun and helpful and we could do the next Solidarity Summit really about these larger scale um, ways of doing things. And I was thinking about inviting Podair also from where you are. Um, yeah. Right, because then, there, then there's the whole re real estate investment co-op is yet another model that they're using. Yeah, so if, you, if you're interested in starting to pursue this idea and then helping reach out to uh, your other local folks, that'd be great. And everyone else is welcome, please to offer up your ideas and suggestions and um, offers for any aspect of these Solidarity Summits. This just came to mind because, uh, oh, and then our other uh, featured guest is here locally and um, she works with Madison Community Land Trust and she's been developing a sort of forward, a new forward thinking model for cooperative land trusts uh, building and governance. So she's going to be another featured guest. So yeah, the aim is to, to apply this stuff toward the very complex things because we can do it. Um, people do it all the right. time. Yeah. Yep. Um, and awesome. then, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying awesome. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So then the other things I was hoping to do would be to get back down into the very specifics um, to see if we can go into a little bit of a bit about a basic agreement that people would get started with in a common fund. A couple things for those of us who've just begun to kind of sink our teeth into and, and push us forward the next level. Prior to that, and you're welcome to suggest a different course of events too. Prior to that, I would like to just do a quick, or it doesn't have to be that quick, but to do a go round. So everyone who's with us can say something if you want to reflect or exp ask a question, express a need. Um, if you don't have anything, you can either stay on mute or say pass. And I'm trying to look at the chat in case your audio just isn't working. Um, Kurt, any questions or comments? And Angie? Um, Angie? I don't have anything. Okay, great. Angie, I know you need to type in the chat, so let us know. Um, Rachel? Yes. 
Uh, and then Annalise, any questions or comments um, or suggestions about what you think we need in an early agreement as we're setting up our common fund? I think maybe just, <clears throat> uh, just priorities, you know what I mean? Like if you've identified needs in your community and there's a common agreement that maybe you need to create opportunities for food or create, you know, so maybe as a starting point, identify something that everyone's agreed on to start with as a, as a priority for that money to be catalyzing. That's all I Awesome. And, and uh, thank you. And I will share that we identified a while ago, we were going to prioritize debt relief just to start, but we really want an emergency fund as well. So I really, really appreciate what Phil suggested about Anyhow, uh, yeah, about like the savings pool part is more for debt relief. It's built for that. And then the giving pool would be more for emergency fund, I think. So I think you answered sort of a structural question that I forgot to frame. So thanks. Um, Zev? Actually, I'll, I'll let Dawn go because you were just speaking for a while. So Dawn, um, do you have questions or insights or things, and especially since this is geared toward meeting your needs, if you can identify anything that, that, that you want from the rest of the time? Um, yeah, well, I appreciate, I'm, I'm really excited about the, the, um, the new pool accounting um, around the reciprocity, um, like being able to draw money, draw a loan, even though if there's no savings in there and then up, upon paying it back, the um, there would be money um, in the savings, um, savings pool um, that's been generated from that loan. So, um, but I guess in with thinking about the reciprocity of that, and that's an important value um, and I think when I go back to governing, I think of and wondering if somebody who knows more on how that actually works in economic or financing, because um, so far, like, I, to me, I feel like sometimes it's easier to just work on trust and that's a big important value in indigenous communities I mean we never had all this accounting system for thousands of years and we and and so it's really a, an important value like culturally and um, I think it can help to avoid a lot of the bureaucratic kind of accounting I mean I, I, I know that we do need to account and use a lot of these tools but but I guess I'm just always wondering how to make the trust work better. And I think I'm not an economist, so how to speak about that in, in financial terms is really an interesting question for me because um, I can speak to the, the value of trust in relationships and the importance of that in, in our culture. But yeah, so I'm just curious about that. How does that work in financial terms? I can answer, actually. All right. Are people okay with that? And then we'll keep going around the circle to make sure other people can share after that. Yes, yeah, sir. So, or yeah, shall we wait? Is that all right? Go for it. Let's go around. Let's park that and come back to that as soon as we go to the rest of the group, because maybe a couple of you could answer a couple of questions at once. So just checking quickly if Sean Bay has anything. Or Tim, and just unmute if you do. Well, and if you... I'll pass. Thanks. Okay. Shambe? All right. Okay, go ahead, Stephen. I think that was you first. Um, what has worked when it comes to trust is um, the microfinance. Uh, stuff that was done in villages in um, Bangladesh. And um, I'm familiar with one organization. I know the founder. So we've talked a lot about this together about how to make, um, how to make um, uh, micro loans work in a village. And basically um, all you do 
is that you have a small group of people who support each other with loans and they meet once a week and they look each other in the eye. And um, the idea is, is that um, uh, th there's a, a payment every month that you pay back. You can use reciprocity or you don't even have to use that. But um, uh, the group as a whole makes a decision uh, about if someone needs a loan, then they, um, the group makes the decision together. And I, I think that might answer your question about the simple way to do it, because all you need is a bit of paper with how much someone's borrowed, and then another bit of, or the same bit of paper, where you put in how much people pay back each month. Does that answer your question? I, I'd like to build on that a little bit more and also ask Phil and Annalise to fill in a couple of blanks too. I'm going to share just a tiny bit of what I learned from them, but mostly my own experience um, and part of the, the vision in this form. Um, so the way we're construing common funds, and of course, everyone's totally free to do your thing how you want to. But a thing that I'm interested in trying and in encouraging is in our common fund, we want people to need to become members of a local mutual aid network. So mm. if you want to borrow, you become a member. So now you are co-owning and co-governing this as a cooperative member. And, um, and we, you know, we are building our, we're practicing sociocracy forms of governance and I think it is quite well suited to this. And there's some different tools for supporting people using that. Um, and the thing that I think can really help shift things so this can become more of a wealth redistribution engine. I, when I was visiting New Zealand and learning about the savings pools, I realized I, I see our mission is turning them inside out sort of. So if you picture those people like, holding hands in a circle, looking inward, picture them now like spinning around. So they're looking outward and like offering to join hands with other people holding hands in a network um, and start being able to flow more money, but also like all different, everybody has a different gift to offer. The people who don't have as much money tend to have more time. You know, there's certain, you know, there are all kinds of skill sets. So that is the, that is, um, the point of connecting it in the mutual aid network framework because not only are you now governing it and owning it with the other people who are in the pool, but we all understand time banking and we all understand sharing and we all understand how to use posh charity, posh charity budgeting tools to reduce our need for money. And again, like sort of systematize all that stuff that Phil was saying happens naturally. Um, so really the aim is to like create and use social structures and economic structures that actually do drive the building of real trust. And then um, what I learned from people in New Zealand, um, which when I was there a couple of years ago, only one person had ever failed to follow through on their whole commitment. And it was just the reciprocity part. They actually paid back the principal. And again, it was from a lot of face-to-face it is governed face to face and everyone takes responsibility and accountability and in our mutual aid network uh, framework people sign on to the core principles it's all values based which is very clear and clearly communicated and i'm going to stop talking soon but i also wanted to draw your attention dawn and everyone else i shared this workspace with everyone but if you play this game the savings pool game from New Zealand, it really helps see how neighborly it is and it really helps demystify it and helps them. Um, so I would really recommend, we played that here, I'd recommend playing it with the group who want to participate and just see how it feels. Okay, I'll stop. Um, Phil or Annalise, you want to share anything about your, um, about this question about trust and governance? Or Phil, I guess maybe go to you next. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. So um, obviously, when you've got a small group, people who probably met or already knew one another through some sort of common bond, like maybe a lot of you work at the same place, or you have a, you know, some sort of some sort of commonality, the trust is already usually there in pretty, you know, in a pretty good amount. The thing you have to do is kind of break down these taboos and barriers about 
talking about your, your own finances, you know, so that's the, the hurdle that we all get over when we start a pool is just sort of opening up to everybody and saying, well, this is our situation. You know, this is how things actually look for our household and that sort of thing. And by, by doing that and also by sharing your aspirations, like I want to get out of debt or um, we'd like to own our own home or, you know, we want our kids to go through college, whatever. So you've got, you've got these goals, you share them with the group, the group comes to an agreement as, as to how to help everybody meet their goals, puts them into some kind of priority and you just sort of get moving on it. Um, the, face-to-face pool them in when we got together. A lot of us already knew one another because it came out of a, um, a, a course that everybody had taken. And so everybody was on pretty, um, pretty good, friendly terms with one another. And in the first instance, we also said, if you know anybody else, you know, that would be a good fit for this group, go ahead and shoulder tap them. And that was like our first generation of, invitations and we we got together and in the first meeting we just sort of had a you know just lay it out what what everybody's situation was what what they hoped for um, what their challenges were that sort of thing and then we said right as a group what do we want to do first and we all agreed the first thing we're going to do is knock off any high interest debt so anybody who's got a balance on their credit card or a higher purchase anything like that we were going to deal with those first. So in the first few months, we paid off like five or six credit card balances and got these people out of this, you know, crazy 20% type interest payment debt. And then we moved on to, you know, the, the more fun, cool stuff. And, and it just sort of, you know, we've gone by that progress. I think when you've got an online group, it's a little bit more difficult because you don't necessarily know one another. So that's when you start working on things like what are the, what are the requirements? If, if you don't know somebody or they're, they don't live in your area, but you share a desire, you share these common goals. So that's when we come up with things like security agreements. So that's when you say things like, um, we, the group, want to lend you the money to do this, but just in case something were to happen, and this isn't even supposing that, you know, the person is like dishonest or going to do a runner on you. You're just thinking, you know, what if something happens to this person and the agreement falls over? You just have a way of protecting the pool's interest, and it can be quite simple. In New Zealand, we have a thing uh, a tool that one of the government ministries puts out. It's called the Personal Property Securities Register. And it's an online form that you can use to register a security interest over an asset, um, not property, but any other asset. So typically things like cars and appliances and stuff like that. So uh, pool here could use that. It's a $20 filing and it basically just says if something happens, you can then actually apply to take possession of this tangible asset to recover whatever cost you're on the hook for. If we do property lending, we actually get a mortgage. If we do other types of lending where there may be some security involved, we can, we can ask for a guarantor. So uh, another person can co-sign an agreement and say, if something happens, I will step up and make the payments on their behalf. So we've got all these different ways to provide the security in a case where the members of the pool may not be comfortable with the amount or the purpose of the loan or just the circumstances. Just, you know, and different pools have all kinds of different thresholds and ways of dealing with this, but those are some of the common ones. Thank you. Um... So I have a question right now. Uh, I, I have two questions. One is about accounting software, how you do the accounting, and if you're willing to share that. And other suggestions are welcome if other people have some, some insight around this. 
And then the other thing is I have been looking at your generic member agreement template, but not very carefully, actually. I, I thought that we'd like look at it a little bit today. But um, what I'm really hoping for today is that I could just um, easily see my way towards sending something out to the other members of our common funds who are now two people plus me, but there are some other people who want to become members, I would love to be able to send them out like a draft agreement that looks like something we'd want to start at least working with or start talking about. And I would also want to send them, um, yeah, an invitation to participate in the simplest way possible. Um, so yeah, I'm curious, uh, curious if you use a particular accounting software and what you'd recommend. Sorry. So pools in New Zealand mostly do one of two things. We've got a volunteer up in Auckland who has developed a big and quite full-featured spreadsheet that he can drive, and he's trained a couple of other people on how to drive it, that records all the incomings, all the outgoings, all the points calculations, and it does a lot of nifty stuff like you can do the tagged funds. So like if somebody says, I have savings in the pool and I'm gonna need them about 10 months from now because I'm traveling, but until then I don't need them. So people can tag funds or they can signal that at a certain date they need access to their money. So that lets you make some forecast to say, right, we can get this money out now, but we just need to make sure that there's going to be enough repayments coming in between now and that time that this person can, can, can withdraw their savings when they've asked to. So the software helps to do that. It does other things like calculates each pool member's exposure to all the active loans. So and this can be pretty complicated to figure out, but it can be important too, because if somebody had to leave the pool suddenly, or say somebody got incapacitated or died and their family or their estate came and said, um, what's, you know, what's this person's involvement in the pool? Can we settle up? It's good to know exactly what all the connections are so that you can keep things fair and not shift the burden or shift the, um, like shift all the lending onto some people more than others. So, um, you know, it's just all these things come into play and, and this developed over time because as Peter was doing the record keeping for different pools, these questions would arise and he'd say, oh yeah, I can build that formula in or, oh yeah, I know a way we can, we can, account for that. So it's a, it's a big and kind of unwieldy thing. And as such, it's not very user-friendly or portable. So he's, he's trained a few people in how to use it, but it's not something that we recommend other people just pick up and use because it's, you have to get inside Peter's head to do it. <laughs> um, so that, that's led us to a lot of pools now just sort of roll their own spreadsheets mm -hmm. and they're simpler than Peter's. They don't necessarily do all of that whizzy stuff, but they're good enough for the pools that don't have real complex lending situations or are willing to do the things a little bit more on the hoof. So um, I don't know if you've got one of those in that shared folder, Stephanie, but I think I sent an example spreadsheet a while back. Oh, that would be great. Um, if, if you don't, I will send it. I'll send Trevor's spreadsheet because I'm Trevor. Not in, it. In, yeah, we would really like that. He's um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I will send that. It's, it's a simple one. What he does is he takes, um, he just takes the, the bank statement each month and reconciles everybody's incomings and outgoings. He makes note of upcoming requests. Like if people say they, they may want to borrow or withdraw at a certain time. So it just tracks everything and calculates all the points. 
uh, we would love that. And, and he's comfortable. Like, can we share that sort of universally so Don could use it, we could use it? Absolutely. Yeah. I've, um, it, like I said, it's an example. All the um, names have been anonymized, so they're just made up names and amounts. But yeah, so you're, an, you're another free, to, free to share far and wide. Fantastic. Yes, I'll get that from you. I'll, sh I'll share it in the savings pool workspace that I showed you and I'll send it to people who participate in this or send the link to it. Um, cool. Yeah. Then the other question is it sounds like the, the bells and whistles one would be really good as we grow and so just offering in the mutual aid spirit you know we are doing a lot of work with tech interoperability and connecting with coders and working on developing apprenticeships for coding so first of all i would love at some point to offer human hours to get trained on that big spreadsheet um so we could have those kind of bigger capabilities or more complicated and i would love to have that be part of the whole conversation about the interoperable open source tech tools we're looking to help develop. And I know it's a separate and overlapping conversation and, and people don't all know this, but I know Phil from years before I heard about Savings Fools because you did our server for our Time Bank software, Community Forge. Right, and the, the, whole, the whole notion of having a, um, a good, solid, stable, open source platform that we could run all this stuff on um, is that's sort of like the, the um, kind of the big picture dream that we've had here. In fact, for a number of years, we've tried through living economies and through the efforts of some of the pools to, to get some software developed. The big problem that we've keep running into is the budget to, you know, because, you know, when, once again, it comes down to building something like this is not going to be cheap if you mm -hmm. want to do it right. And if it's going to be software that lots of people are using and depending on, you really do want to have some, you know, some high level development skills, but Peter and myself and a few other people have gone after this problem. We've written up documentation. We've, you know, we've talked to developers. We've come up with a budget and a plan. What we haven't come up with is the funding to actually make it all work. So we'd love to mutually aid with that because we, and, and then I'll invite you into our interoperability conversation. So I never have like specific leads on money to offer, but we are applying for funding in a variety of ways and places. And we would like to have the most comprehensive possible picture. Um, Steven has shared another platform too. Is that who's starting to speak up? Um, I uh, also want to come back to the member agreement thing. So whoever's trying to talk, take it away. Uh, just really quick with this um, interoperability platform, uh, just that there is this fellow Jake Mum from our area who I, knew, I know Stephanie's working with, but who lives in Western North Carolina and this um, other person, Grace. And the idea has emerged in the last couple of weeks of, them actually uh, gathering up some developers um, here in early May to do a sprint and try to churn out a rough kind of alpha version of this kind of platform. So Phil, it'd be really great to get some of the documents and ideas you've, you've worked on into that mix if they're not um, already uh, via Stephanie and humans platform and just being in touch with us. Exciting. Yeah. Happy, yeah, happy to collaborate in whatever capacity. That's great to hear. Yeah. So, and actually, Jake had asked me to pull together another interoperability call because there's a lot of movement on different separate fronts. So, um, I'll invite you also, Phil. Anybody else cool. who wants to be part of these, let me know off this call, um, and we'll move on. That uh, fantastic, cool. Um, uh, Stephen, did you want to say anything about the open collective platform before we move into the uh, member agreement stuff? Uh, you were asking about it. It's um, something we use in economy. Um, it works very well. Um, it works very well uh, when you've when you're many people who are working together uh, virtually. 
because it um it shows you your little group it shows you what you're putting in each month and it shows you what it's being spent on and you know where where the money's going and you don't actually need to meet to do it so i put in a we all put in about five dollars a month or something and we just use it to to run online events and and just keep the to keep the um a collaboration ongoing it works quite well great i've played with it a little i wasn't able to um get my stuff together in that way but um yeah you uh you upload your invoices and things like it's it's very very transparent very um community managed right yeah correct but it's not something for a a, a local fund like phil's talking about mm -hmm. but anyway it's i'll just put it out there you okay, asked so like, yeah so it, it would be like something that could help support something like the online pool he's talking about is that what you're suggesting Exactly. Yeah. And um, the, the other thing I want to mention here is is that um, we're talking about doing mutual aid, and I think it's very important uh, get, getting out of debt. Um, but there are other aspects to this, and uh, another aspect is what we'd like to call um, uh, communities of practice. You know, like like what we're doing now. As a community of practice, we're, we're meeting online, and and as communities of practice grow, they start to need a little bit of of um, a little bit of funding can sometimes help to um, uh, smooth the uh, to oil the machinery a bit. But it's a completely other form of of mutual um, support. So uh, since you mentioned that we. Uh, we have a model that we want to pursue about how to use this for a basic livelihood. We called it a basic human livelihood, and then we thought we could call it a lively humanhood. And actually, um, I'm just going to throw out there, I'm hosting a Posh Life workshop um, here on Monday, um, but I was going to host it online as well. Um, and that's where we uh, collectively do our posterity budgets. Um, yeah, so we, we, we work together on this posterity budgeting worksheet, which shows how we can have better quality of life with less money by displacing our, our monetary needs with, um, you know, with uh, shared resources and mutual credit and stuff. So I'll just invite you, um, if you want to participate in that, I think it is quite relevant as, as a way to like fund the communities of practice and actually have money be in the mix so people can do this kind of stuff as part of their remunerative work life. You speak up, please. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just. Uh, I'm kind of sad that it went away, but at my church, we had a program called Helping Hands and those who had greater amounts of money put into the fund as an emergency fund for those that had lesser amounts of money. So if somebody's furnace went out in the middle of winter, they could come to this group and say, my furnace just blew up. And then three people would sit down and meditate on it and decide, is this doable to help this person? And then they would follow through and, and pay the contractor directly and take care of that and, and help them. So I don't know if that's something that we can work into this type of a, a situation yes. in the future. Um, I think it's, it's needed very mm -hmm. much so. Um, really the aim here is to just like see what we can learn and how we can apply what other people are doing to meet exactly what we want to do and exactly what's needed in our community. So absolutely, it sounds like completely related and your experience would be really helpful. Um, so uh, can we talk about member agreements for a moment or is there anything else or Dawn, do you have a, a question that feels more pressing to you since we're about at the 15 minute mark? I can't, 
can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have time to look at the savings pool member agreement that you have prior to the conversation because I might have been able to to think more specifically about a question. But um, yeah, and I just want to say, unfortunately, I have to leave in about five minutes. So okay, but I'm really open to learning. I'm at 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 uh, basically, um, it's all brand new to me. So everything I'm hearing is really great learning for me. Excellent. And I'm gonna put in the um, I'm putting in the notes the agreement templates um, that I am gonna show right now. And um, frankly, I haven't looked at the agreement template super closely for a while. Um, but looking at it right now, I am feeling like um, like it might be just fine to take this and then add our basic membership agreement from Mutual Aid Networks, which spells out how we're governed and owned. I think it might be fine to start with these as our basic agreements. And I'm wondering if Phil or Annalise having some experience with disagreements and with um, savings pools. If you feel in retrospect, there's anything missing or anything that was like off or do you think it's good enough for now and safe enough to try and then we refine it over time? Phil, your thoughts? Um, well, my experience and also just the feedback I get from people around the, the show is that the simple member agreements are good, simple pool agreements are good, and that a lot of the heart of how a pool works is really in your protocols and your processes and how you, how you arrive at um, decisions and how you deal with things as they come up. So uh, a simple enough agreement that just basically says, we're going to do things by consensus, we're going to respect these basics, you know, I think that's always a good starting point, not to make it too lengthy or complicated, and then just say, we will develop protocols for dealing with stuff and keep a record of those as they come up. So, you know, keeping minutes of meetings is a good idea. Keeping um, records of anything that, you know, if a situation comes up and the pool figures out how to resolve it, making that part of your record because you may revisit that at some point or you may come back to it and say, wow, that was a, you know, that was a really creative solution and it really worked or we might want to do that a little bit differently next time. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. So, um, I, I just, um, yep. something in, um, when I, um, I'm on the online pool and we started that up because we were the kind of living economies and we were all over the country. So that's sort of how it happened to pilot it. But I, I got a, um, a loan from the pool to start, um, get some money together to um, do a first draft of my book. And then I hit the wall and um, couldn't make the repayments that I'd agreed to. So I wrote to the group and said, look, I'm in this situation. Can I reduce my, my payments but increase my length of time so I'm still meeting my reciprocity? And, um, and the group agreed because I was able to communicate and, and it went back round. So the thing is, once you've got an agreement, if you've got that sort of trust and goodwill in the group, then um, it doesn't necessarily need to be said in con concrete. Things can change with you know, with consensus and agreement and, and that and, and being having the protocols that you're encouraging people to communicate can be really helpful as well. But this is where we start to mitigate the, the dominance of the banking system by actually having compassion and kindness in our systems. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so I think it's about time to check out. Um, I'm going to start the round and uh, as usual with our meetings, like if we're coming around to you and saying it's time to check out and you're like, I had this burning question, say your burning question or bring up whatever you need to. So it's a soft checkout. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start by saying I got my questions answered for now. I see my way forward to sending out the draft agreement to the people who are 
already part of it and who want to be part of it. Um, and I will tie the MAN mutual aid network governance agreements along with the savings pool agreement to become our common fund agreement. So I appreciate that. I also will look forward to sharing all our stuff with all of you in case it's helpful to you. And then embarking on some discussions where we build and document the process of like dreaming up what we want to do over time and, and um, document how we do it. So uh, that's my path forward from this and then doing more of these summits to get into more complicated territory over time. But this was helpful to me and I would really love to thank every one of you who participated. Now I'm just going to go down the list and, and you can either check out or throw out your last burning thing, Kurt. And then Angie, you need to type yours in the chat if you have anything. This is Kurt, I don't have anything. All right, and then Zev. Zev? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, sorry, it took me a second to get to the mute button. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this and learned some things and felt like I, I, uh, you remarked a bunch of topics that I'd like to learn more about from the people on here. And I just think that this is a really cool format. Um, so thanks, Stephanie, for calling us together into this. And uh, let's keep this rich conversation going. Thanks. It's been fun. Annalise, I know you just said something, but it wasn't a checkout. You have a checkout? Just really valuing the collaboration. I think that we can maximize and move things much more powerfully and faster together. So um, really nice to be on with you all. Nice. Thank you. Um, Dawn, feel free to take a, a, take an extra moment that this, is, this was designed to meet your needs if you want to. Anything that's outstanding for you still or any checkout you want to give? Thank you. Um, yeah, I feel I appreciate the agreement template and um, I, I'm just thinking like I know I'm for me the big thing is time like I really that message uh, was very affirming for me to hear was it Phil or was it um, Stephen who was talking about, you know, that this is another kind of um, demand demanding of our time. And so I'm just trying to figure out what that transition looks like for me and my practice and then build a, a community of practice around this that um, where people can actually give this time to be because I feel like the transition is requiring us to be living in two, two different concepts of time, like building relationships. I love the piece about looking people in the eye and building trust that way. That's very much aligned with an indigenous relationship based way of being in community. Um, and, but to do that and to be present with people in that, um, when you're running around trying to respond to the existing, um, you know, proposal driven funding kind of capitalist, system um, is a transition and it, it just requires more. I'm going to be reaching out to, um, I don't know, it feels kind of contradictory, but we're developing funding proposals to get paid people into this work who can give it time because I, I have a hard time. I'm at my maximum capacity for trying to volunteer a whole bunch of, uh, or try and coordinate a whole bunch of people that are giving time freely, but not able to do that when we need it and how we need it, um, which requires another demand on time is just managing all the relationships. So yeah, I'm just still trying to figure out what that transition looks like, how we can actually do that. Um, but I think every conversation every kind of narrow path created kind of brings, I guess, brings us to a step closer, but I'm going to see if I can try and get somebody on our next call with the Solidarity Summit so that, um, so that there isn't much as much of a, so I'm not holding it up because I have little time. 
So wonderful. And we are, I mean, that's the reason we need to get the common fund stuff together right away. So for real, you can get paid money for your time or you can get your needs met for, for this work. That's the aim is we have to be make an economy that supports this work because it's the valuable work. So uh, you are very much in my thoughts as I think about the solidarity stewardship fellowship and other ways that we're looking to make basic livelihood um, real or lively humanhood real in this. Thanks for being part of this. And I really look forward to going on the common fund journey in concert with you. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. So um, Stephen, check out Burning Need. No burning need, but thanks very much for being uh, inviting me in. And I've learned a lot, and it's uh, very inspiring. And um, I love what you're doing with Mutual Aid Network. So keep up the good work, everyone. Thanks. Yeah, every, everybody's welcome to participate as much as you possibly will. <laughs> um, so, Sean Bay, it was really nice to see you here. I'm so excited to do more with Cooperation Jackson. Any checkout or burning needs, questions? And we'll see if Sean Bay goes off mute. Um, and meanwhile, um, Tim, check out. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay, yeah, I, um, I'm grateful that you all had me on the call and learned a lot. And I will be grateful to share what I've learned with the organization and see how we can get it here. I think it will, will be helpful in times like we are in now with this flooding and all that's going on. There's a lot of needs that's going to be need to be met. So thank you all for letting me be on the call. I'm sorry. I didn't even think about your flooding situation when you showed up. I'm really sorry that you guys are dealing with that and I hope you're all okay. Are you okay for now? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. It's just, you know, it's a lot. Other spaces is not so, not as, as well, but my area of town is, is okay. Send our love and then, um, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah. Um, we should be thinking about things that we can do for, to support you. So if you know of things or check in with the mutual aid disaster relief folks too. Thank you. Okay, no, no problem. And I gotta go, thanks you all and y'all have a good, good week. Bye, take care. Tim? All right, bye-bye. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was nice. Um, I'm, my sense is that uh, my enrollment is just one big step further forward from this. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And yeah. Phil, Phil, do you have a closeout? Uh, just, um, it's just really exciting to hear some of the things that are going on, and um, I'm, I'm really uh, charged up about this whole common fund idea because I feel like it was sort of the, the missing piece in the whole puzzle and I'm yeah uh, keen to see it move forward now. Great we're excited too. I've, I've like forgot to have my um, local compatriots check out so huh. are you? Well you know what it occurs to me that the, the, there's three words that keep popping into my head over and over and over during this meeting and that is time, talent, and treasure. And that is that many people might not have treasure. Many people might have a lot of time. And so, you know, maybe we can figure out a way to, to make it happen for all kinds of people. And um, thank you for inviting me, Stephanie, to this meeting. Thanks for coming. John? Yes. Uh, it's a, it was an amazing meeting for me. Uh, but I, I was looking at the, uh, at the policies and uh, regulations that, that most of everyone spoke about towards, mm -hmm. towards, towards the uh, collaboration of local state and federal services and uh, some of the guidelines that we bumping into that hinder us from moving forward. Uh, I was really looking at that because I work good on, on government issues towards communities and, 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 and residents and citizens. And, and, and I'm really good on that, but to be a part of a network of people from different countries and all that diversity, you know, that's amazing to me you know, other than just America. So, mm -hmm. so I see they have the same issue in, in, in their communities. But, but I come to find that from our, our institutions here and their institutions, 
corporations taking over. Yes. Okay. So I find that it's the corporations that have the control of, of the service in the people. Mm -hmm. So so I, I'm glad to find that it is, it is worldwide than just here. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, for, uh, yes, thanks. It was super sweet to see people from all over the place. Did everyone get a chance to check out now who wants to? If not, speak okay. now. All right, Don, sign off. Okay, um, thank you so much. And I also am super inspired by uh, how far flung we are together. Wow. Wow. And um, yeah, you all make my life much more hopeful it's and beautiful. enjoyable. So thank you very much. Feel free to share the recording. I'll post it at mutualaidnetwork.org. Look for stuff in the blog, um, join and look for things on the mutual aid platform. And um, thanks again. Look forward to talking with you again soon. Some of us at, in two months time at the next Solidarity Summit. Thanks, Have, Stephanie. Thank you. Have a good day, evening, or night, wherever you are. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Ciao. Bye, all.